So I've been working on this new site, which allows you to set up health checks along with notifications and incident management for your websites. And basically you have a site and this site will have several different health checks and those health checks will run on an interval. So the health check interval could be every hour, every 30 minutes, every 10 minutes, every five minutes or every minute. And so I started to think that if I'm doing a health check every minute, there are 60 minutes in an hour and there's 24 hours in a day. So that's 1,440 health checks. That doesn't seem too bad. But then you multiply that by 365, then all of a sudden that inflates to 500,000. Well, that's the number of records that my database would accumulate every year for one single health check. So then I thought, what if I end up having 100 different health checks on the system? So now we're talking about over 52 million records on a single table. And so I started playing around with the data and I started to realize very quickly that if this is not architected correctly, then as the application grows, it's going to get slower and slower and slower. And so in this episode, I want to look at some of the things that we can do to sustain having a large database and to be able to see that database with a lot of records in a short amount of time so that we're able to test out our site's performance before it actually gets shipped to production. And then to be able to look at some of the examples here where we have some lazy loading so we can give some immediate feedback to our clients, but then maybe put the heavier things in a background job. And to refresh again, you can see that we have a little swirl in some of these as it goes through and try to figure out the health checks. But if I go back into the show action on one of the sites, you can see that it actually loads up really quickly. So we're going to look at some of the decisions that I made on this application. So when it comes time to work with the table that has a lot of data, you have some awareness on what you can do to make that table still performant. And if we pull up the table and get its size for the health check logs, you can see that it has over 282 million records. This particular query took about six seconds to run. So as your database table gets really large, you are going to start having some problems with speed and and it's really at that point where you have to be really careful about even running a query against that table because any kind of query could be very expensive. And if I refresh this page, let's have a look at the development logs that it generates. So when we go to the Sites Controller show page, it fetches my current user, and then it also fetches the Drift and Ruby site. It then needs to get all of the health checks from the Drift and Ruby site. And then you can see we're hitting the health check log because there are certain data on there that we need to be able to pull out. And keep in mind that this table currently with this query has over 282 million records and it took half a millisecond to run this query. And I didn't do anything special on the Postgres server. I'm just using the defaults that it comes with. So the first thing that we see is that we are getting the health check log for a particular health check. But then you can also see that we are looking at the checked on date where it is between two different values. So the first tip here is when you're running a query, the larger kind of date range that you're going to be searching on is going to make the query a lot more expensive. For example, if I had shown an entire month, so if I had done from July 1st to the end of July, then this query would have taken significantly longer to run. But half a millisecond is very quick. And then another thing to consider is that when I go to delete a site, it's going to delete the health checks and then all of the health check logs. And that could be an extremely expensive task. So I'm going to run this in the background and you can see that this may take a few minutes and that's because it's going to be ran as a background job. So something like that, I think it would be okay to run in a background job because that's not something that we need the user to have an immediate response on. And if I were to refresh and deleting a few more of these, it ultimately comes out to be about 30 to 40 seconds to delete a site. And that seems like that takes a long time. But when you're dealing with that many records, it very well could take a significant amount of time. However, if optimizations were not in place, and if we just followed a lot of the standard Rails tutorials on deleting associated records, then that 30 seconds definitely would have taken a couple of hours when we're talking about over 200 million records. And let's take another example where we're creating vehicle trackers for a fleet management application. 
And so let's say we have a vehicle and a vehicle has many vehicle trackers. And then we're calling dependent destroy. So whenever we destroy a vehicle, it's going to delete all the vehicle tracker records. And the vehicle tracker records belongs to a vehicle and it's going to capture some information about the vehicle at a given point in time. So if we look at the table schema, there's a primary key, we have a vehicle ID, we have a latitude and a longitude, which is just the GPS coordinates for a vehicle. We have a check to see if the vehicle is speeding and that's just going to return a true or false value. We're then gonna have some kind of maintenance required check, which is also going to be true or false. And then we're going to have a recorded on, which is going to be a timestamp of when this record was actually recorded. Because when you're talking about fleet management systems, the vehicle might be recording the data, but it may not actually upload to your database at the point in time in which that data was captured. So the created at and the updated at records would not be accurate enough for something like this. So in our fleet management software, let's go ahead and run Rails DBC to populate the database with a lot of records. And on the left side, I have the console going so we can see the database queries that's getting generated. And you can see that it's inserting a lot of different kind of fake data into the vehicle trackers. And if we give this a bit of time in the seats file, I have it set to print out how long it takes to create 10,000 records. So for the first 10,000 records on a freshly truncated database, it took about 28 seconds. And if we let this run for a little more time, we'll start getting some more data. And so for letting this run for a couple of minutes, you can see that we're getting some pretty consistent results with it taking about almost 30 seconds to generate 10,000 records. And while that doesn't seem like it's all that bad, if we're needing to create millions or hundreds of millions of records, then this is just not going to be sufficient. And so first, let's look at our schema. Because there's a couple of things I wanna change about this schema. Because if we make the assumption that I'm never going to look up a vehicle tracker record without a vehicle ID, and if we're never going to delete a single vehicle tracker's record, then there really isn't much use of having an ID column within this table. And if the ID column were an integer, like in previous Rails versions, it defaulted to an integer, then we would definitely be in trouble here because unsigned integer is going to have only like 8 billion record IDs that it could generate. But for a big integer, you may not run into this problem because I could believe it could store up to 9 or 18 quintillion. However, when we are talking about a very large table, each column within this table needs to be carefully considered. If for no other reason, for the database size. So when we created our latitude and longitude floats, we never gave them any kind of parameters of the precision. And also with our created at and updated at timestamps, since those really aren't recording the accurate time in which this vehicle tracker was made, then it may not actually produce much value to have within our database. So coming in here, if I know that when I run a query, I'm going to pass in the vehicle ID and then also the recorded on timestamp, then I definitely should have an index on the recorded on. So I could do an add index and then pass in the vehicle trackers, and then I can add the recorded on. And that would work because we have our vehicle ID because the belongs to is going to automatically create an index called vehicle ID. So this one would be a little bit redundant because that's going to happen automatically. However, we would have three indexes on our table, the vehicle ID, the recorded on, and also the primary key, the ID of our table. And in a lot of cases, this is just going to be wasted space. Because when we're talking about hundreds of millions of records, each column is going to have a certain amount of space that it takes up, and it really does add up. So instead, I'm going to comment out the vehicle and I'm just going to make the vehicle ID manually. And I can still keep in the same parameters, no false, and I can keep the foreign key and we'll set that to true. But then we still have the issue of having our vehicle ID being indexed. And we're actually able to do that with passing an array into our index. So we can have our vehicle ID, comma, and then our recorded on. And so, if I wanted to pull up all the vehicle trackers for a vehicle, then having the vehicle ID 
As a first item in the array, I would be able to do that with the index. Or if I wanted to search for all vehicle trackers by a particular vehicle and record it on a certain date or a date range, then we have our index for that as well. And then we can also avoid creating our primary key ID by passing in additional parameter in the create table. So if we pass in the ID false, then this would omit the vehicle trackers table from having a ID column. And for the latitude and longitude, we can change these to a decimal and then pass in a precision of 10 with a scale of six. And this way we're limiting the value that these two columns would be. And then we can also remove the T timestamps that was automatically created when I generated this model because that's going to get rid of the created at and the updated at timestamps. So if we take a look at the seats file, you can see where we're creating all the records for the vehicle trackers. And there are some gems which support bulk inserting, but in Rails 6, this is provided for us. So to do it, I'll comment out where we're creating the vehicle it's getting the parameters from the vehicle tracker record and we're passing in the vehicle ID and that simply just generates a hash with the data for the vehicle. So instead, I'm gonna create a variable called records. I'm gonna set this equal to an empty array dot tap and then do array. And this is just an easy way to create an array where we can then push in values for an array. And in this case, I'm going to just push in the parameters for a new vehicle. So it's going to loop through these 10,000 times, and then we'll have a very large array called records. We then take our vehicle tracker and then call insert all. And if we pass in our records and save this, then this is going to create an array of 10,000 records, and it's going to insert it into our database as one query opposed to 10,000 separate queries. And so if we run this now, you can see that it's creating 10,000 records in one second or less. So this is going to be significantly faster in seeding our development database. And if we look at the logs, you can see that it's creating the records in bulk. So it's making one query to the database with all the data instead of separate queries for each individual ones. And if we scroll up to find the line, you can see that it takes about 154 milliseconds to insert that bulk data in, plus however much time it took to generate the data. But it's still significantly faster than the 30 seconds that we were seeing before. So if we go into our console, I'm going to set the variable V to our vehicle dot first, and then I'm going to get the size of all of our vehicle trackers. And you see that we have 70,000 records for vehicle trackers for a particular vehicle. So if we call it vehicle.destroy, we're going to be met with an unpleasant error. You can see that we're trying to delete from the vehicle trackers where the vehicle trackers empty string is null because it's looking for an ID here because when you have a dependent destroy, it's going to create a M plus one query that then goes through and deletes each vehicle tracker individually based off the ID. And that could be a very slow process when we're talking about 70,000 records. However, if we change this destroy to a delete all, that is gonna have some caveats with it. So any associations of vehicle trackers that have a dependent destroy or any kind of callbacks on the vehicle trackers wouldn't be called. But if we reload our database now, and if we reset our vehicle, and if we try to call the vehicle.destroy, you can see that it took about 50 milliseconds to delete all the vehicle trackers because now with a delete at all, it's now searching for the vehicle ID to delete all the records instead of deleting each one of the vehicle trackers individually. But again, you want to be careful with this because any association dependent destroys or any callbacks may not get called. And so that's another piece of advice if you can piece that together with dealing with very large tables. You want to be careful on any kind of associations that you're creating with them. Because if it ever comes time to have to delete that data, you might be in a tough situation. And then for the AJAX request with the availability, I simply made this a stimulus JS controller, which if we inspect this, you can see that it's just a controller. It has a target. I'm passing in a data URL. And then we're just replacing the contents with the return from the AJAX request. 
And to accomplish that, check out episode 189, Saving Individual Attributes with Stimulus.js, because we look at creating an AJAX request within Stimulus and then updating our client side with the result. And you'll be able to tailor that to many different kinds of situations. So you're essentially providing instant feedback as far as the page loading to the user, and then you're loading the individual complicated queries on the back end. Well, that's all for this episode. Thank you for watching. For more videos, check out driftandruby.com.